All right, so real quick before we get started, there's something you may have noticed. The name of the channel is now different. And there's a good reason for that change. So here's the deal. Uh, when choosing the name Randomonium for this YouTube channel, I didn't do quite as much research as I should have. And I may or may not have thought of the same name as a couple of guys from Bat19, John and Danny. So yes, there are two Randomonium channels. Some of you pointed that out in the comments section of some, pre of some previous videos, and we've since been in... I can't speak. And we have since been in touch. And we decided that it was in our best interest for both of us if I changed my channel name. They're much larger, they're well established, and I really don't want to step on anybody's toes. So yes, same channel, same content, same presenter, different name. So I just wanted to let you guys know that nothing else has changed except for the name, which by the way, I hope you guys enjoy. Also, I'll leave a link to the other Randomonium channel, John and Danny, a couple of great guys, really great to work with. But I'll leave a link to their channel down in the description below. Anyway, I just wanted to make sure you guys knew what was happening. Uh, Let's get on to the rest of the video. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to my latest project and new shopmate. Everyone, meet Igor the Automaton. Now this is a bit of an odd one out even for my channel, but it's something I've wanted to explore for quite a long time, and that is automation through purely mechanical means. I've always seen a magic in controlling things through physical properties instead of the traditional computerized methods. And thanks to your patronage of my channel, I've been able to take the time out to do things like this now. So the definition of an automaton is this. Automaton, noun, a moving mechanical device made in imitation of a human being, or a machine that performs a function according to a predetermined set of coded instructions, especially one capable of a range of programmed responses to different circumstances. It's not a word commonly used, and as an art form, it's definitely dying out. I thought, what better way to spend quarantine than making a new friend? So here's the deal. Uh, this is a fairly complex device, lots of small moving parts, so fitting all of the instructions on how I built every single piece into one video would result in nothing less than a movie. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some short clips that I took in the build process just to explain some detail while I have everything apart and separated just so you can have a better idea of what's happening and what's going on without the clutter of everything else. And then, and then I'd like to go through from the ground up exactly how it works because the principles behind automatons are all virtually the same but there really isn't a lot of instruction. So if you've ever had an interest in building something like this, or even just seeing how they work, or if you just have an appreciation for mechanical artwork or kinetic sculptures like this, then I hope you really enjoy this video. Then please, like the video and don't forget to subscribe so you stay updated on all the videos as they come out. And the subscriptions really help me out as a creator. So I appreciate it. Now take it away, me from the past. All right, so I think all of the pieces are done. So now I'm going to give you some tips on putting them all together. So I'm using rivets for the main purpose of them being low profile. So I can put things together like this, and then I can use short rivets that don't run all the way through so I can leave space for my pulley here. So it's a very convenient way to put things together, but it is fairly permanent. You'll have to grind them off and put new ones in if you ever want to replace anything. But in this case, I don't think it'll be a problem. So the way I made these, is in these cases, are uh, quarter inch rivets, and I just took some quarter inch stock, cut them to the length that I wanted, Basically, the length of the material that you're trying to put it through and add an eighth of an inch on either side, so a quarter inch in total, to peen it over to create the head of the rivet. And to peen a rivet, you're going to use a ball peen hammer, hence the name, and you take the rounded edge and then you just hammer to sort of mushroom out each end. Obviously, you want to do one end at a time and then dry fit everything together to make sure they're going to fit. And then once you get them together, you'll peen the other side and you'll be left with something that's, that's fairly permanent but also provides a lot of strength. 
Like I said, I can't go into detail about putting it all together just because of the mass of information. So, if there's enough interest in this video, I'd be more than happy to put together a list of all of the parts and the dimensions so you can replicate this project for yourself if you're interested. So let me know in the comments. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put this together, and if I come across anything else that I want to share, then I'll go ahead and do that. So peening rivets is a fairly straightforward process, so there's not a whole lot I can say, but the only advice that I do have is to do the smaller things first and then incorporate them into the larger pieces. And then make sure that you don't over tighten your rivets. Make sure that they still have a plenty of swing, but you get rid of all that side to side motion if you can and they will loosen up with time. There's not much you can do about that. So both shoulder and arm assemblies are complete and functioning, so now I'm going to attach them in the middle using these points here. I'm just going to weld them together, so basically these become continuous pieces. Don't worry, Jimmy, you're not being replaced. I don't think the people would settle for that. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to explain this in the order that I built it. I started with the most complicated part being the shoulders, and that's where we'll begin. Now, the tough part about the shoulders was I had to be able to move things all the way down here while it's in any one of the positions. Another way to say that is I needed to be able to move the elbow here, here, and also while extending forward, here. Completely independently and without each movement being changed by another movement. And so the way I did that was actually quite simple. The first thing I did is I designed the shoulders completely in CAD. I didn't record any of it because it's not terribly exciting, but I think I can give you a pretty good idea of exactly how this works. Basically, we have three movements to the arm. We have, and I, I don't know the actual anatomical names, but we have shoulder up, we have shoulder forward, and we have elbow up. Now, first keep in mind that this is a prototype. This is just a very first attempt at something that resembles a human that moves mechanically from a pre-programmed set of discs. So he is a little rough and his motions are limited, but to get the fundamentals across, this I think was a pretty good demonstration. So every motion that you see has to be done by lifting or dropping these followers that ride on these cams, which means that that needs to be kept in mind even though whenever you're building something like this you always do the controlled surface before you do the controlling surface. So what that looks like for this motion is simply this stylus when it rides on that follower it goes up and then we have a translation of motion from there into this little bell crank and then the top of the bell crank there's a connecting rod over to this and there's a small bearing which rides on this surface here. Now this surface is the exact radius of this rotation point for this movement. Because remember, they all need to cooperate in the same way without affecting each other. Another thing to keep in mind is that the pivot point for this needed to be the same as the pivot point for this. Just because they needed to move in unison and this needed to be able to ride on this radius here for the complete duration of the movement. So again, those two pivot points move in unison and you can see there's only one stylus moving for that motion. All right, next up we have this motion here. So now we can see that we're rolling on that bearing and we're pivoting along here. Now we had to make sure that the control for this movement was located in the center of the point of rotation for the shoulder. Because otherwise if it was off by a tiny bit or if it was a solid something over here for example, then of course the relativity from it to here would change depending on the motion. And while that would have been doable, it would have been difficult. So what I've done is the point of rotation is actually, well, the axle is a hollow piece of tubing. And the shoulder is actually welded to this split coupler, which attaches to that tubing and allows for the control in this motion. But to control the elbow, in the center of rotation, we have a cable running through. And these things here, these pulleys, are actually just sliding door rollers, which you can pick up relatively cheap at a hardware store. And in fact, all of this was purchased in my local hardware stores. Uh, nothing special here. It's just the time that it takes to turn the raw material into the parts that you need. 
but because it's in the center, the cable doesn't change tightness. Another thing to keep in mind is because to keep that in center, we also needed to make sure that the bottom portion of this pulley was located in the center of this. So it's just a lot of little intricate things that you have to keep in mind, but it's really not terribly complicated. So as I was saying, as this lifts up, we needed a way to change the direction to pull on that cable, just like this, to make his arm go up and down. But the motion of that cable is a lot further than I wanted the travel of this follower to be. So what I did is I gave it a mechanical advantage. So obviously you have a connecting rod between the top of this follower and this lever here. And the distance from here to the pivot point is half the distance of here to where the cable attaches. And what that does is it gives me a two to one advantage so that this only needs to move half the distance for this to move the full range of motion. So because of the mechanical advantages that we can employ, you can make sure that all of these move in approximately the same amount of motion, despite the control surface that it's moving, moving however much it moves. So that's what you need to keep in mind when designing a shoulder, or that's what I kept in mind anyway when designing Igor's. Now, translating motion from here all the way to the hands would be quite difficult. So for a prototype, I decided to opt out of that this time, but for a future version, when I make Igor a friend, a more complex device that well, frankly, has a bigger range of motion and more motions in general. I think it would add a lot to have some sort of moving hands, even if it's just one open and closed motion. So I actually have an explanation from past me on how to design the cams for your controller. So this is essentially his brain. You can tell he's a guy because it's located in his stomach. So I'm going to give it away to past me to explain how to build his brain. All right, it's me from the past. I've just completed cutting out all of my control discs or cams, And I thought this would be a good time to show you how everything goes together while I have it in pieces. I think everything is complete and one thing I would like to note here is that there are 3D printed parts in this build, but that was only for cost savings. These are simply half inch spacers that fit around the half inch drive shaft. And these are just 3D printed pillow blocks because I already have these bearings and I wanted to save some money instead of purchasing new ones. So don't be intimidated, you do not need a 3D printer for this project, I just did to save on some cash. Now all of these parts are going to go together and they're going to sit right here. And as it spins, of course, as you saw, it'll push on these here and it'll control all of the motions of Igor. So I said that I cut these discs out, but now I'm going to tell you how. So like I said, all these are our cams. They sit on a centrally rotating shaft and then as they spin around and a bump hits the control styluses on the automaton, of course that stylus will ride up the bump because this will continue turning and then down the other side, thus pushing the control rod or cable or whatever it is and actuating the motion of the automaton. Now there is a little bit of math involved in getting the motions that you want to cut into this, and it's really quite simple and I'll explain it now. The first thing you need to know is the maximum movement of the part that you're trying to move. For example, and these aren't calibrated all to be level yet, but they will be, uh, but for example, this will move up one and a quarter of an inch to complete the full motion. Uh, same with this, this, and this one, which is the forward shoulder out, and the center ones are for elbow flexion. Now these ones only move three and a quarter inches, so keep this in mind. So this is the left elbow disc, so each one of these bumps will only be a three quarter inch rise above this central line here, which they all share a commonality with, just to keep all of those level, if that makes sense, because they'll all be riding on the same shaft. So the size of the disc here doesn't really matter, it'll just control the amount of maximum time your program can run before repeating itself. So this will be mounted on a shaft here, and it'll be spinning at three RPM, so I knew that each rotation would take about 20 seconds. So I'd have a 20 second long program just with a setup that I have. Of course, that's infinitely adjustable. But keeping that in mind, since we know there are 360 degrees in a circle and we divide that by 20, then we know that there is 18 degrees of movement per second. So for example, from the start of this point here to the central line there, that is 36 degrees. So there'll be a two second rise of the left elbow. And then in two seconds, the elbow will go back down to its natural state. This one is a little more extreme. This is for left shoulder forward. As you can see, they all share the common starting point of the hole, uh, which rides on this shaft to keep them all spinning, of course, because otherwise they would just, you know. <laughs> so this is the start of our program as it spins, two seconds up, two seconds down. Then this is a much shorter one. This is one second up, one second down. So that's really all you need to know about programming. Uh, it's not too terribly complicated but cutting these out with an angle grinder is a little bit of a pain, so that's really where all the work lies. And of course, I wanted the programs to be interchangeable, so now I'm going to show you how I chose to do that. 
So this is the central shaft that's actually being driven, and then this is just a pin to make them all rotate as one. And they slide on, just like that. And these spacers are just a half inch in my case, and that keeps the same spacing as these guys. So there's a half inch between the center of roller to center of roller. And here's something a little bit different. You might have to make some slight adjustments with washers uh, because nothing is ever going to be perfect, I wish. So now we have our bracket. Of course, we needed access to this side of the whole shaft just to remove the parts. So this slides into this bearing here, and then this plate is detachable. So this fits over the end of this. And then there are some bolts that go in those holes there. And then finally a wing nut on the threaded end of the shaft. That goes over the top, fastened down, and then I'll trim off the rest of this just so we don't have access. Okay, welcome back. So that's how that goes into play, and it is completely interchangeable every disc, so I can change and reprogram as I deem fit. The program that you saw at the beginning, and that you'll see more of at the end, is just what I have for demonstration purposes. It's not a real difficult one, but I wanted to make sure that he worked smoothly for the sake of this video. Okay, now onto our user interface part. Basically, we just have a chain here. These are, unfortunately, these are the closest I could get, but they are not a one-to-one -one gear ratio. I think this is 12 teeth, and this is 14 teeth. So there is a slight difference, but it doesn't really matter. But we have our slave side and then we have our master side. Now unfortunately, the motor that I was originally going to use to drive him, it didn't provide enough power. As unfortunate as that is, it would have provided a lot smoother motion and I would have been able to operate him while I'm doing something else. But I decided to make this production out of some bicycle parts that I had lying around and I think it actually turned out pretty nice. So this program in the front was designed to be a 20 second program to be run by the 3 RPM motor, but unfortunately that didn't work out so it does run a little bit faster and I didn't have the bike parts necessary to slow it down even more. But basically, I'm not going to go into the numbers of reductions, but we have smaller to larger, and then on that same shaft as the larger, we have another smaller to larger to the smaller, basically one to one to the cam set. And then on here on the back, I decided as an afterthought to give him some head motion as well. And so that's just a simple bell crank with a connecting rod to another follower onto another cam. And because this shaft moves at approximately the same speed as that, it worked out pretty well and it gave him an extra range of motion. And everything here is just welded up out of whatever steel I could find lying around. And of course, what I needed to purchase, I did purchase from the hardware store. Now, his limbs are a little bit heavy, especially for something that's as small of a movement as this. It's going to require a lot of power over that movement, since I've reduced it in many cases to move this as much as it moves. So, you may find it necessary in your case uh, to add springs to assist with the lifting and the motion. Now we have a pull spring here, just to help lift with the weight of the arm. And then we have a little compression shock that I made here, just to help with the elbow. And this is nothing more than some tubing that I put together and then I welded a couple of pivot points on with nuts. It's really all quite simple. Just a lot of time. And then his head was made out of some scrap sheet metal that I got from a friend. So I guess what I would really like to share in this project is that if you have interest in mechanical design or anything like that, but you see it's too daunting, this looks from an outside perspective, taking it all into view, very complicated, but when you boil it down from step by step, it's all just one very simple device. That is, in essence, intricacy. There's lots of very small, simple things put together. And individually, we can all comprehend them. And because of the modern tools we have like CAD, you can take all those small ideas and put them together into a functional design and see how they interact without actually expending materials. So if this seemed like a lot, remember it's really not as complicated as you might think. So like I said, my reason for building this was an exploration of mechanical design specifically in recreating, I guess, well, robots, human motion. And I'm sorry I couldn't go into as much detail as I think I probably could have, but I don't think it would have been interesting. But if there's enough interest in this video. In fact, I'll set a like goal for the first time on the channel. If you guys want to see detailed instructions of him come out eventually, or even a redo where I build a more complex version, then please like the video. Uh, I'm going to set the like goal really high because I think you guys can do it if YouTube likes this video. 10,000 likes.
So I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. If, again, you have any questions, feel free to ask or email me even, and I'd be happy to do my best to respond. Don't forget to like, subscribe if you want to see more, check out some of my other videos, which will be in the end of this, and don't forget to check out Randomonium down in the description below. I hope you're all doing well in quarantine, and I'll talk to you in the next video.